the church celebrates the examples of the saints. Men and women of different times and cultures have heard God's voice and responded to him with singular love and devotion. But the way we treat the saints also speaks to something about our own faith, the way we look at the world, at humanity, and at God. From scripture up to the present day, our faith has used the example of saints to inspire and remind us of our call to be like them and to be like Christ. We will look at three things. The saints as people, the saints as disciples, and the saints as witnesses. The saints are flesh and blood people with varied lives, messy families, and endless complexities. We can identify with them. The saints encountered Christ. He found them and chose them for faith and to learn from him. We are called to imitate Christ in discipleship. The saints use their lives to witness to the power of God at work in them. As witnesses, they revealed God to others. They reflected the goodness that is God himself. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul writes in his letters to the saints in the church, the living saints. Like Christ, Paul does not reserve sainthood for the chosen few, but expresses that it is the vocation of all the faithful. Each of us are called to be saints. By faith, we are already becoming saints. For as Paul says elsewhere in Ephesians, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. The saints reflect the complexity of life itself. The variety we find in the world is, in another way, expressive of God's manifold goodness. Well, part of the genius of the church is that uh, we have so many saints and the saints are so diverse. The saints are not monotonous. There's a wide variety of personalities, styles, backgrounds, education. Um, what do they all have in common? They've all become the friends of Christ. They've all allowed Christ to live his life in them. But the perfection of God is such that it requires this wide variety of manifestations in order to uh, show itself adequately. There's no one saint who expresses the fullness of God. Each of the saints, in his or her own way, express something of God's uh, power. I use the image of uh, the, a bright white light that passes through a prism, and then it breaks into many colors. Well, think of God's being as like this intense white light, God's perfection, but now it passes through the prism of the saints, and it splits into all sorts of colors. And so we look at that wide variety, and we get something of God's um, total splendor. It's also why it's important for each person to find a saint, maybe who corresponds to his own deepest longings or style or background. Find a saint who, yeah, he's like me or she's like me. Also, I've argued, uh, find a saint who's not like you. Find one who doesn't have your background, your interests, your style, because that saint will probably complete something that's lacking in you. But all of them in their splendor represent uh, the fullness of God. I think the most fundamental quality of a saint is a saint is someone who has allowed Jesus to get into his boat. And I use that image from the scriptures when Jesus gets into the boat of Simon without being asked, without being invited. He just gets into the boat and then begins commanding. And Simon cooperates with him. Okay, we'll go out in the deep. and Okay, I'll lower my nets for a catch. Even though, Lord, we've been at it all night long and caught nothing, but I'll do what you want. That's a saint. Uh, 
So a saint is someone who has decentered her life. It's no longer her projects, her plans, her goals. It's now what Christ wants to accomplish through her. And so she sees herself as a vehicle. Again, that's not to be construed in a domineering way, as though I, I uh, negate myself. No, no, you actually find yourself. That's why, you know, the saints are always very vivid personalities. I don't know if really an exception to that. The saints are, are vivid, uh, memorable, striking personalities. Even like the little flower who's just spending her whole life in this quiet little convent in northwestern France. But talk about a vivid personality. Because see, the closer God gets, the more we're lit up from the inside. It's like the burning bush image, which is so powerful that when God comes into the world, he lights the world up without consuming it. So the bush is on fire but not consumed. Uh, classical mythology, whenever the gods come in, they destroy what they have encountered. They, they have to clear out a space. It's not true with the Bible, but it's the saints are like, the, like a burning bush. They're on fire with Christ, but they're not consumed. They're lit up. They become more radiant. Sainthood is relationship. It is a relationship with the Son who is the head, and we, the body, are the church. On Ascension Sunday, our prayer at Mass reads, Gladden us with holy joys, Almighty God, and make us rejoice with devout thanksgiving. For the ascension of Christ your Son is our exaltation, and where the head is gone before in glory, the body is called to follow in hope. Christ is alive in the fullness of God, and we, the body, share in that fullness through hope and faith. How do we grow into the fullness of Jesus? By becoming his disciples. Discipleship is both learning about Christ and becoming like him. This quote from the second letter of Peter summarizes discipleship nicely. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be the more zealous to confirm your call and election, for if you do this you will never fall. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Discipleship takes many forms because each of us is different. What remains constant in every saint, however, is their pursuit of Christ in their lives. For some, it is through study. For others, it is through prayer. For some, in administration. For others still, it is through meditation and contemplation. Others find Christ in service, and others in poverty. Through it all, however, is the desire to find Christ in what they do, and to exalt Christ in their own fruitfulness. One way to characterize sanctity is simply becoming a friend of Christ. It's becoming Christ's friend. Better allowing Christ to live his life in you. When St. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. That's what it means to be a saint, that you allow Jesus so to dominate your life in every aspect, that he's your Lord. Of course, dominus in Latin just means Lord. He's the Lord of your whole life. And here's something, because I've stressed a lot, this non-competitive quality of God. You say, well, you know, I'm no longer alive. You're living your life in me. It sounds so oppressive, as though I've just surrendered everything. But see, no, when you surrender to God, who is the very ground of your own being, you find yourself. Read Paul's letters. His personality is evident on every page. His unique form of intellectuality, his own 
passions, his um, uh, emotional life. I mean, all of it's there. Paul is Paul. But he can say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The old self, focused on ego and success and money and power, all that business. That, that doesn't matter. It's no longer I who live, that old self. But it's Christ who has come to dominate me. And that means I, Paul, have found my deepest self. That's what it means to be a saint. For our final reflection, I would like to return to Mother Teresa. Her name kept coming up in my research and in conversations on the subject with others. A striking aspect of her life, especially as we learned after her death, was that she experienced a great spiritual darkness and distance from God. While her experience is not necessarily common, it expresses something profound about the sainthood we are all called to share. When we speak of Mother Jesus' darkness, as she herself called it, uh, you know, it's something that's not simply what John of the Cross called the dark night. Because okay? normally the dark night is preparing someone for this union with Jesus, for contemporary, real deep contemplative prayer. So it's different than simply the dark night because it's not preparing her for a union. It's paradoxically the way she's living her union with Jesus is by not experiencing that union. Now she was a woman passionately in love with Jesus. She wanted to, as a young religious, she made this resolution to love him as he has never been loved before, which is a daring thing to say if you're taking it seriously. And so the trial is that she feels that Jesus doesn't love her. She feels unwanted, unloved. And then she feels that she can't love Jesus as she wants to love him passionately, as he's never been loved before. The darkness as a missionary of charity, we might call it an apostolic darkness, which is she's in solidarity with the spiritually poor. When she uh, went into the West, she discovered and realized that, as she would say, the greatest poverty in the world today is to be unloved, unwanted, uncared for. And that could be the experience very common. It could be a rich person in the middle class. Anyone uh, can have that experience. When she would travel, even in Calcutta, she would travel, people would come and want to speak with Mother Teresa and they would open their hearts to her. So I can only imagine the, some of the horror stories that she heard. And so she would have this empathy because she had also the same sense of, yeah, I know what it is to be unloved and unwanted and feeling lonely. You know, really to want to, be, to love and be loved and it seems like it's not there. One of the things Mother Teresa teaches us is what commitment is. And love is not principally a feeling, certainly it's part of it for most everyone, uh, but in the end, uh, it's, it's classical Thomas Aquinas, so love is in the will, and it's our, it's our choosing. The profundity of Mother Teresa's example for me is that she reflects an aspect of Christ's life, namely his suffering for our sake. When he says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He says it from the depth of his person. Jesus feels the weight and the cost of sin, how it severs mankind from the love of God to the point of complete silence. Mother Teresa felt that aspect of Christ's final moments in her very person for decades. She came to understand the abandonment of sin, but also the courageous constancy of Christ's love. She allowed those who examined her life through the eyes of faith a window into the very heart of Christ. Every saint, because of love and because of who they are, are capable of revealing Christ. Just as Bishop Barron used the example of a prism, I also like the image of a mirror. We reflect the brightness of God's light through our lives. This is why the great image of the church, the body of Christ, is so beautiful. It not only expresses the unity we have in faith, but the ability for each of us to express something of the true, living, and risen Christ. What saint inspires you? And what part of their lives do you see Christ alive in? 
just as Christ called his disciples, just as Mary instructed his followers to listen to him, and just as the saints worked for the salvation of all, how will you allow people to encounter Christ?